Good. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so both online, we have, I think, some unknown number of people joining us online, and we have a whole bunch of people here in person, which I'm really excited about. So people online cannot see us, so they'll just be imagining really beautiful people speaking here. Um, but they cannot so see us, they just hear us. They cannot see us, they can just hear us. Okay. Yeah. So Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, so welcome everyone. Bienvenue uh, ici à l'Université de Montréal uh, avec uh, Growing Up in Science. Uh, je ne sais même pas comment on traduirait en français. Um, grandir en science. Grandir en science, uh, disons. Uh, so uh, this will be uh, in English um, to accommodate for those who don't speak French. Uh, so, uh, my name is Flores. I am uh, an assistant professor here in psychology at Université de Montréal. And I am uh, very, very happy to have with us today uh, our colleague um, Sonia Lupien, who I think hardly really needs an, an introduction. Um, <laughs> for most people, uh, actually, like I, I was about to, you know, like read all the prizes that she got, uh, but I realized that the list is kind of too long. So you know, we would, and since we're already late, I will skip that. Uh, phew, so I don't have to do that. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, that she's uh, the director of the the Center for Studies on Human Stress, uh, which is uh, like a beautiful in institute because it is combining research with. Um, what we call like uh, vulgarization, I guess you can yeah, call it. It's like is uh, is knowledge transfer. So trying to like not only like understand human stress, but also give tools to people to help cope with stress better, which is what we need right now because <laughs> the video was not working and the room was occupied here, as you know. So uh, so we have a good example. Uh, and uh, uh, just a little anecdote. Um, uh, Sonia Lupin wrote also the uh, the, the, uh, the book uh, Par amour du stress. Uh, it's probably in, in English as well. It's coming. It's, it's coming. Okay. Uh, and actually, so uh, this was recommended to me the book uh, by my mother in the Netherlands. <laughs> it's, uh, because I was talking about stress, she said, "Oh, you know, there's this like this this great like book, you know, and it's like uh, it's, it's by this uh, like professor in uh, in like in Montreal. Maybe you know her." <laughs> so. Um, in case my mother is watching, uh, here is the person who actually wrote this. <laughs> so, um, the idea for today is to uh, give some attention to the personal human side of science. Uh, so, you know, as you probably all know, when we see scientists speak, you know, usually we hear about all the wonderful grants that they got and all the beautiful papers that they got published and all the results that were like amazing and life-changing. Especially, I think Sonia has many examples of that. Um, and, and that's definitely one of the exciting parts of science. There's also another side of science that uh, is, you know, that's a lot of hard work. And things don't always go as you want. And you get rejected many times for grant proposals. Um, so uh, this is a, a time to basically allow space for both those sides of science and everything in between. Uh, so, uh, so that's the idea. So um, the, the setup for the session is basically, um, like I would love to give the floor to Sonia uh, for you to tell us a bit about yourself, where you're coming from, and uh, then um, in particular how you became the scientist that you are. And, uh, and then uh, there will be space for questions also from the audience. Um, so questions to like help understand more um, who Sonia's, what Sonia's road to science was. Um, and we'll also have some time if you want to share maybe some of your personal stories and hear reflections of Sonia uh, or even other people on that. So we'll kind of like gradually broaden um, in the session here today. So with that, thank you very much for, for being here, Sonia. Thank you for inviting me. Take it away. Sorry. Once upon a time, no, no. I was walking the dog this morning thinking about you, Floris, and the question you would be asking me. And I think that if I became a scientist, I didn't know that even the job for scientists exists before I was 20, something like that. And if I became a scientist, it is because of significant teachers on my pathway. And I will always remember this. And because of this, I teach here in psychology. And every year, don't repeat this, anyone. Every year, I, I teach at the bachelor's degree. So every year, I, I say to the department that I will need the room for an extended period after my class 
for revision, which is absolutely not true. And so once I have the room, I sit with any students from my class. I think I have 200 students in the class who want to have information about graduate studies, doing a PhD, master's degree, how to find a supervisor, write a letter of recommendation. Because some people did it for me, and I would not be here today if they were not there. So I do this every year with the students. And I would say about you know three quarter of the class will stay there. So story short, came from a very small uh, uh, city up in the Lorraine and, uh, and from the mountains, and uh, low socioeconomic status. Uh, you know, everything is fine. And then I went to college because I didn't know what to what else to do. And I go, I went into psychology because I had no idea. I knew I liked school. That's all I knew, and that was it. You know, I read a lot of books, and I remember one day my father. Uh, hide my books because he thought that I didn't have enough friends so he didn't know about introverted people I guess so um, and I had this amazing crisis saying that I, I wanted my book but that's the only thing I knew basically I just follow my intuition and I ended up in psychology because I didn't want to do mathematics and physics and uh, then there was this man and this is a nice story because I found him recently I found this man he's 81 years of age and I have breakfast with him once a month and so this man was uh, Monsieur Ducharme, Robert Ducharme. He was a teacher at the CIGEP, and it was an experimental psychology class. So we had to do an experiment in psychology. And I didn't have any idea what to do, so I asked to see him, and he took the time to talk to me. Really took the time to talk to me. You know, I was all alone in this uh, CIGEP, whatever. And he asked me, what are the classes you like in you know, courses? I said, I love biology, and I love psychology. So this is about the 1980s or 70s, 1980s, I don't remember. And so when I told him I love biology and psychology, he ended me, he ended me a paper by Sperry and Gazaniga, who had just won the Nobel Prize for their work on, you know, split brain patients, etc. And he said, read, read this, perhaps it's going to give you some idea, you know, for your experiment, and, and, and we'll see. And I read the paper, and I, I looked like Obelix getting into the potion, because I... <laughs> I mean, it opened up everything. I said, this is what I want to do in life. I, it, it was amazing. I was So I took the paper, the scientific paper of Sperry and Gazaniga, and I went to see, you know, these orientation people in school where you go and they tell you what to do in life. Huh? So I went to see the guy and I said, read this. Tell me what to do, to do this. And he did a good job because he told me to do a you know, bachelor's degree in psychology, blah, 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 blah. And I did it, basically. But then I ended up here in psychology. I did all my studies here. So I, I found this man later, 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 because I really wanted to see him and just to thank him for being there. And uh, I did this amazing experiment during uh, this college class, you know, just so he understands the experiment. We're all scientists here. We know that the right brain controls the left, right? And the left controls the right. And I said, okay, if I take right-handed people or left-handed people, and I asked them for 12 hours to use the other hand. I will induce a split in personality. Well, I was 16 years of age, okay? So that didn't make sense, but please. <laughs> so I uh, did this, and then I went to a psychology. And still, being in psychology, I wasn't sure really, you know, what science entailed, etc. And it was one of the research assistants of Franco Le Pori in my class of psychophysiology who decided to stay after class and give us tips how to find a supervisor, etc. And I followed exactly what Louis Richie, now he's in, she could see me, uh, he's a scientist over there, did. And so I always had people on my pathway, opening up doors that I didn't know existed. So I did exactly what he did, and I did, you know, my PhD in geriatrics, and then uh, started to work on, uh, no, I did my master's degree on visual immunoglect. I'm always interested in this, you know, split brain or the, uh, and then I got, I did my, my bachelor's degree in psychology. And I did my master's degree in neuropsychology, and then I got bored of aphasia, apraxia, blah, blah, blah. And when I'm bored, I want to do something else. So I decided to stop psychology and do a PhD in neuroscience. And I was the first psychology student to go at the faculty of medicine and do a PhD in neuroscience and rat stuff. And remember, I didn't do physics, chemistry, etc., because I was too lazy. So I went to see the guy over there and say, I would like to apply for a PhD in neuroscience, and he looks at me, he says, hmm, you should put all your classes, you know, uh, out of the program because you will fail them all, which was the thing to tell me because I said, watch me. So I called a friend of mine who was teaching physics and chemistry uh, in high school. I said, give me the book. 
going to read it, I'm going to learn. And I did the PhD. I, God, did I work. God, did I work. Because going from psychology to neuroscience, I don't know if you can imagine the switch. But it opened up again. Such a different world because it was just not psychology with all the constructs we have. It was biology. It was genetics. It was, you know, up to genetics and so many things I learned. And that was something very good for my career because it was the first time that I would say in my field of research, you had someone who was, you know, who knew the stuff about memory, attention, etc., and the stuff about biology. And I think if I have an advice to give to anyone, just follow your intuition. And, and I think life will put stuff. I think the best quality for a scientist is not intelligence, is being opportunistic. You have to pick up the opportunities you have and not be shy and just go. If you don't do this, you may just end up doing all the time the same thing. So I was doing my PhD and I didn't know what I would do as a project because I got bored with visual and neglect, so I was in neuroscience. I had no idea about what I would like to do. I was a bit tired about, you know, speci uh, hemispheric specialization. That was Sperry Gazanigo or Gong. And I was looking for a subject, and I was looking for a subject, and it was my second year. I was starting to stress. I said, well, it would be time that I find something to do. So, and uh, again, opportunity. I really used in my career the people around me. I really asked for meetings with mentors or people I thought that would know something and sat with them and was never shy of asking them any questions. That was very important in my career. So I went to see Yves Joannette, who is in geriatric now at the university, and I told him I didn't know what to do for my career. I was a bit bored with, you know, visual living neglect. And he told me about this group of scientists at McGill at the Douglas Hospital doing a research on hormones and aging and stress hormones and I said oh stress hormones so I went to see Michael Meany over there and then second time in my life I said this is it this is what I want to do so I decided to start working with this group even if I was still at the University of Montreal started to read on stress and they, they were interested in me because they wanted to measure attention memory language in the older people they were following they were following a population of older people for 10 years measuring their stress hormones every year and they wanted to measure neuropsychological performance, but it didn't work out. So I jumped in there, and I did my PhD in this field of research, and then my career was gone. Because it was, you know, it was really the first time, I would say, that we could combine neuropsychological research and neuroscience research, or neuroendocrine in this, in this uh, field. So uh, I did my PhD uh, on this, and then my first postdoc, uh, I didn't want to leave for postdoc. At that time, that's about 1993, internet is coming out. We, it, it, we didn't have internet, we didn't even have emails, but email was coming in with the big button. So I remember sitting with my supervisor and saying, why in the world would I want to leave to go somewhere else? Now we have emails, you know, that was good when there was no emails or internet, but now I can communicate with anyone in the world. Why, I was scared. I didn't want to leave. So why in the world would I have to leave? And I was shouting and he says, because this is so important, you have to expand uh, your vision, you have to learn and meet many people, etc. So I said, if I have to go, at least I'm gonna go where it's nice. So I went to California, because we have my beach. <laughs> and I found a good lab over there. And I, and I understood what was a postdoc. It, was, it had nothing to do with communication. It had to do with learning and meeting other people. And I understood something very important with regard to a postdoc supervisor that I always say to my student. You want this person to introduce you to everyone they know. That's the importance of finding a supervisor for a postdoc. You want to have their, you know, this, their mailing list so that you're starting to know everyone. And so I did my first postdoc there, but the supervisor I had, I was his only postdoc. So he put me somewhere in an office without a window for two years, and I didn't have any friends, etc. I did not, I didn't like the experiment. I did a good study, but I did like the experiment of uh, being like that, a postdoc. And when I came back, I had a job. After two years, I had a job at the Institute of Geriatrics. But then I remember sitting in my office and saying, if I come back, with this experience as a postdoc, I will never be able to say to my own students, go, because I don't think it was fun. So I decided, I quit the job, <laughs> stupid like this. That was stupid, I mean, I'm courageous. I quit the job, and I went to do a second postdoc in New York. 
at Rockefeller University with Bruce McEwen, my third very good mentor. And now I knew what the postdoc was. He had a big lab. I think that's important. You don't want to be alone. He had a big lab. This is what I say to my student. He had lab meetings every week. I made a lot of friends. We were going to the restaurant. That was the best time in my life. I didn't want to come back. And then when I come back, I picked up a job at McGill at the time. I was at McGill for 12 years. Then I came back to University of Montreal. But that's the pathway. But Along the way, I learn stuff all the time. And I think because I'm a huge opportunistic person, that's my best quality. And I guess that's what made me a good scientist, this capacity to pick up every opportunity. Mm -hmm. It sounds also like you were, you were at key moments, like you were really relying on your intuition, yep. maybe more than what people were telling you. Would you say that? Yeah, because I'm a stubborn person first. and. I hate laws. What I mean by that, we have a lot of this in science. And I'm always on Twitter. There's a scientific Twitter. I love the scientific Twitter because I learn a lot of things. And I don't know if you are on this scientific Twitter, Flores, but there's two, two groups. Those who say scientific life is bullshit, it's boring, I should get out of there, it's, I'm so unhappy, uh, grants application. And then you have the other group who are like, Okay, it's a tough job, it's a difficult job, but it's a great job, etc. I think I'm more on this side, and you're right, meaning that I always follow my intuition, and when everyone goes one way, I'm always like, nah, not sure, and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try one of the other doorway. The second thing I did in my career, the other big switch, but I'm not telling you to do it. It depends, I think, on your field of research. I have a very good CV for two reasons. First, I do good research, but I don't think I do better research than anyone else in this department or anywhere else. I don't. But I have chose a very sexy subject. I'm working on human stress. I mean, it is a very sexy subject, and it's a subject that you can do a lot of knowledge transfer with. I mean, if I was working on enzyme P450 uh, in the metabolic pathway from cholesterol to pregnenolone, that's a bit tougher to you know, discuss with Mrs. Smith somewhere. No? So I was, again, opportunistic to choose a field of research that, wow, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with this. So that's something as well that, that I did along my career to choose these things that were extremely uh, important and interesting for me. The third thing I did, again, don't do it necessarily, I did this... Uh, this, uh, how can I say this, la course, this, uh, like this marathon, marathon, this scientific marathon uh, publishing in science, nature, PNAS, Lancet, and all the rest, you know, like everything that we are supposed to do in publishing in these big uh, journals and working quite a lot for this and get the big grants, etc. And I published in these big journals, etc. And I had another switch in my career. I was about 45 years of age, or 43. And I was walking my dog, and I had done all this, and I had a very good CV, publishing a lot, doing what I'm supposed to do, right? And I was a bit bored. And this is the year where I had done a study where I showed that when children go from elementary school to high school, they present a significant increase in stress hormones. That has nothing to do with puberty. And we know that when children go from elementary school to high school, this is where we have problems occur when they do. And conduct disorder, depressive symptomatology, suicidal ideation. And although many parents and teachers will say it's because of puberty, it's not. And I said, perhaps it's due to stress. When you understand stress, you said, yeah, perhaps when they go to high school, they're exposed to a stressor that they're not, they have no idea what to do with, and they're stressing. And I had published this paper, another paper in my CV, very popular paper. God, I was popular. And I'm walking the dog, and my kids are 9 and 11, something like that. And I'm walking the dog, and then I stop and I said, well, I know that when kids go to high school, they're very stressed out. I have published a very good paper with this. What's next? What am I supposed to do with this data? You know, producing stuff and publishing it, and the story is supposed to stop there, it didn't work out for me. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened to me, I was walking the dog, 
And I give myself objectives every year. And I was walking the dog and I said, well, Sonia, last year you published 13 papers, let's say. What's your next objective for next year? 14? No joke, 14. What is it? I mean, what is it? That's so the game of publishing in the big journal became very boring again for me. I have these, I think I'm in the, 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 the age or something. I, I, I got bored with this and I said, I don't want to play the game anymore, okay? I don't want to play this game. And what I find stays there, nothing happens. So I remember this morning, I stopped the dog and I said, okay, we're gonna switch right there. From now on, everything I find, I will transfer it to the public who can use it. And I'm gonna start doing intervention. And I'm not good at intervention. I was not trying to do intervention, you know, like these programs, etc. But I said, we're gonna do it the best we can. We know everything about stress. So we're gonna start doing this. And this is when I started to do knowledge transfer. So we, st we created the program that is, that is called De-Stress for Success. I just did it because I was tired of just providing stuff and doing nothing about it. It's the best success we ever had. We created the program, the Stress for Success, and this is when I learned what knowledge transfer is. Because at the time, knowledge transfer, to the year 2000, the CRHR says you have to do knowledge transfer, and it was unidirectional, meaning us, big scientists, transferring our knowledge to the public. Then this thing, right? So. With this approach, I said, we are going to do a program that is called Distress for Success and offer it to the school. We scientists know everything. So we decided to do the program ourselves. The program involved 12 workshops, one hour each. It was very good. It took two years to create. We went into the school. It died right there. <laughs> right there. We don't have 12 hours. <laughs> so came back to the lab, say what didn't work, and I realized that it didn't work because the knowledge transfer was unidirectional. We, did, we, that we had no idea what was happening there in the schools that we needed to provide. So I scrapped everything, and then I started to have fun. We restarted the program, including teachers, psychologists in school, teenagers, I love working with teenagers, and then we recreated this stress and it ended up being five times one hour, you can do more than this. And this was the best success because we tested the efficacy of the program in another project and showed that it decreased stress, etc. so it's fine. So now every year, we started with once a year, but then the teachers asked us to do two or three times a year. We have about 200 teachers, more, and it's in Canada now because of virtual. So they take the training to give the program to their children and their, and their, their students. So we train the trainer, basically. We train the teachers, and then they train their, their students all across Canada. And we have a forum where everyone shares their stuff, working or not working, and telling us how many they trained this year. And we are at 103,000 kids so far. So that's it. So the, it's, it's, it's not a direct pathway because I kind of refuse to follow. You cannot do this at your age because you're too young. You have to be tenured to do this. You have to, you have to do what needs to be done to get you know, your tenure, etc. And after that, I think this is when stuff starts to be fun where you can say, well, I'm not going to play. If you still want to play the game of scientific paper, publish or perish, that's fine. But in my case, I didn't want to do this. I had a lot of fun, so I'm not sure I would have stayed in science if I didn't do that. It also sounds like like that intervention you described, that like first with these 12 weeks, like this sort of <laughs> unilateral approach, like it was dead in the water as you described, and so it sounds like that's that's an important setback, um, and somehow you really transformed that into like making this actually like really explode into something something bigger. And can you say a bit more about Absolutely. how that transformation The happened? public, when I started to do bi-directional, the public became my research assistant. At this point, from now on, and no joke, I had, like every one of us, problems getting a grant. You need three, four times. You need to understand something. Never stop submitting it. Never stop submitting it. I was a director of a research center where I had 54 scientists to take care of. And those that would stop 
in the process saying, oh, I've submitted it three times and they still refuse it. I will not submit it anymore. Uh-uh. Just submit it all the time. And at some point, these are humans evaluating you. They just have to change people on the committee and you have to start all over again. So never, never stop. So, um, oh yeah. So I had problems like everyone getting grants two, three times, and write it down, etc. And then I started to work with the public. So I created a lot of uh, social media, Facebook page, uh, blah, 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 blah. I created a lot of stuff to interact with the public. And from now on, all of my studies were determined by the public. Let me give you an a very nice example. I was giving a public conference on stress. Well, that's... And at the end of the conference, there's always uh, people who want to talk to us. And there's a lady at the end. And she's waiting, obviously, for everyone to be gone to talk to me. That's fine. Then everyone leaves and she comes to me and she starts talking to me about depression. I think it's her who is depressed. It's not her, it's her husband. So I tell her, hmm, it must be very stressful. And then she says, it is it's very stressful, but for me, it's not that bad. It's even worse for my children. Why? Because my son who was a very cheerful child is now becoming quite sad. And my 14 year old daughter uh, doesn't want to introduce her new boyfriend to her dad because uh, you know she, she's shy. And she said one last sentence before getting out of the room. She said, you know, if my husband was stuck in a wheelchair, my daughter would not be sad or, you know, timid to present her boyfriend to her father. But because my husband is suffering from a highly stigmatized disorder, which is depression, the stigma of the disorder will kill us before the disorder itself. And she left. And I remember sitting in the room for 10 minutes and said, oh, whoa. Oh. So I went back to the lab and wrote a grant. And the grant is Silent Victims, the, the title of the grant. And in the beginning of the grant, I give the story, because this is how I do science. I give the story, and I said, the grant is for her. We're going to study it. We're going to see if really the children are you know, suffering from the stress of the parent. So we did a study where we measured the stress hormones in children and parents of family with, where one of the parents has depression. So children are exposed to the stress of the disorder and the stigma of the disorder. And we had a positive control group, which was children and would measure stress hormones in all members of the family where one of the parents has a cancer, but not a stigmatized cancer. I didn't know, but they are stigmatized cancer, lung cancer, for example. And families where they have nothing. And we, I provided the results. We found that there was no significant impact, so I sent the results to the lady as well. But from... And I had so much facilities to get grants. I don't know why, perhaps because it resonated with the reviewers, I don't know. But from now on, I would say that 90% uh, of my research projects are determined by the public. Let me give you an example. I write books for the public. This morning, I just wrote on my social media, I do this all the time. I'm going all summer writing a book on stress at work with the hybrid, the whatever they know. What should I, what are the questions you would like to have answered? And then I have hundreds and hundreds of answers. And then I work with them all and trying to answer them. And this is how I work now. So, but it's because, again, I have a subject for that. That's the advantage. I'm working on stress, everyone. So this is not something that everyone can do, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I hear your your your, but your topic. Just what? Let yeah. me go one step further. It's not true. When I was a director of the research center, when you write a grant, when you write a grant, at the end of the grant, there's a very important paragraph that you have to add. It was requested starting around 2010 by the CIHR. It's one of the most important paragraph. The title of the paragraph is something like functional significance. So why is it that working on bilinguism and brain imaging, rhythmic, etc., why is it important? Why is it that we should take money from, you know, taxpayers and put it on your project instead of your project? And in my research center, when I was a director, I had scientists who were working on very specific stuff, and they had a lot of problems figuring out how 
they could write this paragraph about functional significance, but with, with imagination, you just have to push yourself back and back. And those working on fundamental research, for example, animal research, there's a way you can do this. You have to do the exercise and say, even if I'm working on this enzyme, converting pregnenolone, but in the long run, there will be something. But that's a very, very, very important uh, paragraph. And that's a good exercise to try to understand and uh, test it with other people. Test it with your grandmother. If I tell you this, do you think it's important? No, I'm going to come back. And then I always test it with grandmothers because they have the time. So it sounds like your 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 way of doing science is really like evolved to become a like a dialogue with the public that your that your science is serving. Yeah, because it's their tax. Pay. It's not true. It's true. Right. It's their ta it's their, their income taxes that pays for my research, and I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me because it has to have purpose for me. The purpose was not nature neuroscience anymore. This was not enough anymore, and I'm teaching a new class here in psychology on open science, the reproductibility crisis, etc. And the publish and perish is going to get away eventually. So we're going to have to change the paradigm around science eventually. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm very, very, very happy about that. So I think that we need to find each one of us ways to, not to just do knowledge transfer, but to find ways to build capacity with, you know, these children and schools, etc., and try to, to go above and beyond uh, nature, science, and whatever. I hope I, I, I can take that class. Maybe no, please do. It's this fun. Is, uh, it sounds, it sounds <laughs> very important. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering also, um, this is, um, like, so, like, hearing your story overall, like, it, 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 I get the impression that, like, you had, this, like, a lot of fun doing what, what you do, and, like, you found, you found opportunities that worked with what you wanted to do. And my question is, since you're a researcher on stress, and since a lot of researchers find their jobs quite stressful, <laughs> how do you connect those two? Like, do you, do you experience it as stressful as well, or not? And what determines your experience of this? I thought about doing a, res a, a project on the stress and scientists. I said, my reviewers will like me, I'm gonna get the grant. <laughs> 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 you know when they switch everything? Uh, because I understand stress. You know, there are four characteristics of a situation that will induce a stress response in humans. You don't need all four. The more you have, the worse it is. It has to be novel. It has to be unpredicted or unpredictable. It must be threatening to your personality. For example, someone questioning your capacity to do your job at the coffee machine in front of colleagues. <laughs> the little feeling you have, it's a stress response. And most importantly, you must have the feeling that's important that you don't, you don't have control over the situation. So we always use the you know the acronym don't stress don't go nuts novelty and predictability threat to your ego and sense of low control and I love Twitter my scientific Twitter because this is how I analyze the the stress of scientists and that's it you know so I have I see some scientists say oh my god my paper was rejected and the, so this sense of control and I think that what I did even without realizing it I gained control I gained the sense of control. And I, when I decided not to play the game anymore, I still have a very good CV, as weird as it may sound, but it didn't stress me anymore because I gained control and I decided that I would have fun doing this job. It was less threatening to my ego as well. And it's a stressful job just for you guys. And I will always remember Michael Meany, great scientist, he's still alive. And, anyway. and he told me that his uh, wife at the time she was working in publicity, you know, in these big publicity firms where they have to present a project and everyone destroys them, which is a very stressful and very threatening to the ego job. And his wife had told him that of all the jobs in the world, the only job that was worse than working as a publicity, you know, manager, etc., was scientist. Because there's always someone who's going to tell us that what we've done is bad, right? <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing job. It's rare that we get a review saying, oh, so good, congratulations, man. You know? So it's a, and I had students, two students over my tens and tens of students where I sat with them and I said, I'm not sure you can do this. 
I'm not sure you have the stress resistance to deal with this because one of my students, she would cry for a month receiving the review. She would not be able to, and it's okay because we all have different stress resistance. And as I always say, you thought you had the stress resistance to deal with it, but it's going to eat you alive. You have to think about this. Me, I don't care. Michael Meany trained me. Michael Meany gave me the best trick. He says, Bo, you receive the review, you read them very fast, you do not encode them, and you put them away. You let your subconscious deal with it. Two weeks later, you take them back, and you need to have the humility to understand that if you follow what they suggest, most of it, your paper will become better. But not the first time you read them. Don't do it. I mean, just, it doesn't work this way. Just, at least you have the right to do it. And then, okay, you come back two weeks like that. And it, it works perfectly well, you know, but it's a very, very, very stressful job. And I would love to do research. And I think that... I, I wonder if like, it almost sounds like that's a research project waiting to happen. Yeah, right exactly. There. Like, you know, if you would instruct My reviewers scientists would love to... Uh, like, and you'd measure, I don't know, cortisol at, uh, like, uh, you, measure know, you just stress. receive the, yeah. the review versus, like, right, like after. Yes, and there was this big change in the way we do research, uh, the grant application at CIHR, I wanted to do it the before and after, and we measured these stress hormones in saliva samples, so I could send by mail a couple of spitters to all scientists in Canada. So uh, if I ever contact you, please uh, send me some spit. But uh, yeah, sure, we can do that. You know, gender difference, sex difference, uh, a lot of things that we could do. But it's a, it's a difficult job, and I'm not sure that everyone, and you have to ask yourself, because if you don't have the stress resistance to do the job, you will suffer like hell. And it's okay if you don't have the stress resistance. You're, not, you're just not in the right job. That's not the end of the world. But if you just still think that you can do it, it's going to hurt a lot. And so, so it, it sounds like really important advice there. And, and how do you know, how would you say, like if, if somebody asks themselves, like, is this for me? You know, do I have that stress resistance? How, how could they tell? The best way I would say, and again, I see her at see it on my Twitter. You're not happy. You're not happy when the when the brain detects a threat, it produces a stress response. The stress response sends you a lot of messages that you're stressed out. One of this is spontaneous anger. You know, when you have, you lose it, but this is, this is a sign that the stress hormones are playing on your brain. And so you're becoming slowly but surely unhappy. Things that were exciting to you before are becoming a burden. Why? Because the brain is always detecting the negative. And it's impossible now for you to see the positive stuff that you are seeing. You just see the negative. It has nothing to do with your consciousness. It's just a brain that is in what we call an attentional bias towards threatening information. So it's impossible for the brain to get out of this bizarre state. And people are just unhappy. You can have two people doing the same job. Very difficult job. Policemen, for example. You know, they see death and everything. One of the policemen will develop a post-traumatic stress disorder and the other one will thrive. You have to understand something. If I take 100 person and I expose these 100 person to a very traumatic experience, it's not the 100 people that will develop post-traumatic stress disorder, it's 28. It's always 28%. What is it with this 28 people that made them vulnerable? We don't know, but they should get out of there as fast as they can and choose something else. I think that's, that's something that we have to understand in science. It's not everyone that can do it. It has nothing to do with capacity. I, I think like, what I find important in, in what you were saying, which I just wanted to highlight, is that like, it, it, it sounds also like you're, 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 you're saying it's important to, like, to not sort of bat, bang your head against the wall, like saying for everybody, it's like, oh, you know, like, there's a way to make this happen for you or something. Like in some cases, it just might not, and then it's important to face that. Yeah, and in my class, on jeu, on the reproductibility crisis, I talk a lot to students about... It is as these students say, if I don't get in, accepted in medicine, I, nothing will happen in my life. Bam. Anyway, it's just, don't go there. So as I, I, say, I say to the students, when you have a PhD and or a postdoc, you will have a good job. 
whatever you will do. I mean, that's something absurd. And there are many, many careers, and Twitter and all the others are starting to talk about this. It's not just being a scientist, because we don't have enough position for the, for the number of PhDs we are creating. And Simone has 14 just for himself, and think about it. <laughs> so, I mean, we don't have enough position. It doesn't work this way. But there are so many jobs you can do when you have a PhD in science. I'm talking about scientific journalism. I have a friend of mine who is a scientific journalist who has a PhD in biochemistry. And he has a great job at Azu Canada. And there are a lot of things you can do. Just working in a university, you need to understand exactly the academic world. These people have great jobs, by the way. And, you know, so there's a lot of jobs that you can do. You can work at CIHR. You can work at any, you know, public, uh, private foundation, uh, philanthropist. I mean, there's so much that you can do that. But it is as if we only, this is why it's so important. This is why I'm here, Floris. This is why it's so important to talk to these students saying, it's not the only pathway. You didn't do a PhD and a master's degree just for one job. It's, that would be stupid huh? when you think about it. If you get it, fine. If you don't, fine as well. A girlfriend, a friend of mine, we did the postdoc together in California, and she said in the middle of the postdoc, now I'm bored. I'm out. She ended up at Pfizer. God, she made so much more money than I did. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the same job. So that's what she wanted to do. So there's a lot of jobs. Yeah, it, it, it sounds also like uh, like it, it, it maybe takes some trust in like who you are and what you do to be able to to make those kind of decisions, like uh, you know, like um, jump out of uh, and, out of a job. I yeah, guess. and you make me think of something else, Floris. Well, first you're young, you will have a job. There's no more job, and there's a, there's no more people. Okay, but I have a message for those of my colleagues, senior, listening to me. And I gave a conference once like that to students, and there were a lot of senior scientists or university teachers in the room, and I started talking to my colleagues. And I said, and I will say it on the screen, please, please, please stop telling these students that this is hell. This is something that comes from older scientists. In my time, when I was young, there was no job. They had one position for 2,000 people. So we developed this kind of weird mindset where we always say to people, oh, this is a difficult job. I didn't get my grant. And they say this to their student. And when they do this, I would <laughs> Why? Because what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of saying to students that you will not get your grant? It's not true. You're going to get your grant. And it's a, it's a tough life. Uh, teaching is boring. Do something else. Huh? So, but there's a lot of my colleagues doing this. It is a mindset. Mm -hmm. It is as if it makes me think about, do you remember, I didn't get them, these uh, physics and chemistry teachers saying to students, you will all fail my exam. <laughs> and I always say to teachers, why do you do this? Besides for your ego. The point is, what is the point of doing this? So it's exactly the same thing. So why do you take so much energy telling these people that it's a shit job? I don't understand. And it's not true. It's not always fun. Again, you need to have the stress resistance to deal with the review. Sometimes it's harsh. <laughs> Put it aside so it's weeks and you come back to it. You're not going to get your grant the first time. Fine. My husband, my late husband, I'm now divorced, but it's fine. We were very happy and he's a good friend. But he was a <laughs> businessman, still is. Businessmen are important for scientists. They know how it works. And I was starting my career and I had one grant. And I had to renew my grant because I lost sleep as a scientist over my grant. Not for me. Me, I have my salary. I can, I can pay my house. I lost sleep for my research assistants that would lose their jobs if I didn't have the grant and they had children, they had just bought a house. I lost sleep for them. <laughs> Me, I'm fine, you know? And I remember crying at the dinner table with my husband saying, oh my God, my grant was not renewed. I'm gonna have to let them go. This is a shitty job. I don't wanna do it anymore. And the success rate is so bad. It's not going to work. And he listens to me and after a while says, bah. question. I said, yeah, what's the success rate? At the time, it was 20%. I said, 20%. He said, well, write five grants, you're going to get one. That's what I did. 
I always have five grants rolling. You can do this. Do this every summer for five years, you're gonna get there. And I have five grants rolling. One of them is accepted, the other ones are not fine, I'm gonna review them, submit them. Ooh, this one is accepted, okay, new one, two, two, two. And it's a machine like this. And I was never stressed anymore for grant applications. So these are all little tricks that you can develop so that it decreases, you. but if you just have one grant and you put everything on this, or just this paper in science, or just this thing that for you is so important because I don't know why, you're gonna end up in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a good thing, but it's not always. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'd love to like allow for some questions from the audience. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I, I suppose we can learn to increase our stress resistance. So it's not, uh, also, it's not just a question to have it or not have it. No, no, no. Your stress resistance, you can increase it. And God, did I increase my stress resistance with this job? It's the same thing as training physically. I mean, just by doing it. But you need to understand exactly where you stand. For example, if you decide to train to ride to run a marathon, you're not going to run the 20 kilometers. You will accept that five is okay this year. It's exactly the same thing. So you just have to go, and you have to accept that some can run a 20 without training. <clears throat> But this is like, ah, you do something better, okay? But that's exactly that. So that, that's the best way to do it. Stress resistance, take the review, put them aside, take them back, and try to, it's, it's not that serious. Yeah, we have, we have to have fun. I think scientists are very serious. Too serious sometimes. So we need to have fun out of this. And, uh, you know, I keep a, I'm not going to tell you some of my best citations, but I reviewed a lot of grants, right? I have a file about, interesting stuff written by scientists in grant applications, you know, like, it's fun. It's just fun, you know, like, for example, suicide is a major health issue. <laughs> right. <laughs> so stuff like that. So there's a lot of couple of things you can do to, to have fun out of this, but it, don't be too serious, I would say. It's gonna increase your stress resistance. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, I think we have time for more questions, possibly also from people online. I think if you have a question, if you're online, you can put this in the chat. I think will probably be the safest way. Is that correct, uh, Kevin? Uh, we could try. I think we might be able to. It might actually be a way if you want. If so, if you're online, you can just like put your question in the chat for sure. But if you are willing to try something novel. If it's not too stressful, you could uh, we could put you on the screen and then we could actually see you as well. And while you're looking for a question, I'm going to ask myself a question that a lot of my students ask me, so that I want to tell you this uh, the, the 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 answer. I had a lot of uh, women uh, uh, doing PhDs and postdoc and wanting to become scientists coming to me and saying, Sonia. I decided I don't want to be a scientist. I said, oh, well, why? Because you have the capacity and everything. You know why? It's too, it's too, it's too difficult. It's too, I want to have a family. I want to have children. And I don't know how you do it, Sonia. I don't know how you do it. And the grant application and the people tell me the success rate is very low. And I really want to have a family. And this is not a job for me. And this is not a job for me. And then I let them ventilate a little bit. And then I always answer the same thing. For me, being a scientist, is the best, the best job in the world to be a mom at the same time. Why? Because you have full freedom. And I always say that the story of my, for example, sister-in-law, she's working in a bank. She has a maximum of 10 days per year of uh, free days, you know, for whatever reason. So if she has a child that gets very sick, after 10 days, she's off. My child was born with a congenital malformation. He's perfectly fine now. But he had something like 20 surgeries when he was young, etc. It was a very difficult time. I didn't stop working and my son, my son was very well taken care of. Why? Because I totally remember. Because you can, I brought my kids when I was teaching. And I said to people, if they have to go to the bathroom, we'll take a break. I'll be back, okay? <laughs> and that's it. That's, all, that's the end. I, I, I had a girlfriend. I mean, she was breastfeeding during a meeting. I mean, this is, this is it now. And I will always remember, for example, uh, my, my son was very sick at home after a surgery, and one of my students was finishing a PhD, and she didn't dare, you know, contacted me. I said, no, 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 I'm going to read your thesis, we're going to do this. You come home, and my son really likes it when you put him in the stroller and you just walk. 
So you're going to take a walk with the baby in the stroller while I'm reading the PhD. Give me a couple of hours. When I'm done, I'm going to call you and I will breastfeed and discuss. So you can do this all the time. Depends on the way you see the world. But for me, it was fine. You know, I just sat there, read the thesis while she was walking the baby and, and he was sleeping. And then, so the freedom that we, I brought my children to many, many scientific meetings and they were, you know, taking poster with their little orange glass or whatever. I mean, this is not something that some of the girlfriends or that I have can do. So I never thought that as a woman, it was something difficult. And now, you know, men are more involved in during my time, so it's even better. So I re what I really like now is when I go to scientific meetings and I see the girl giving the talk and the guy, you know, with the baby, I think it's so much nice to see. So I don't think it's an issue for women. It depends the preconceptions you will put there on the table. But in real life, you have freedom. You have a lot of freedom. There's no university would have prevented me from coming to a class to teach with my child. I don't think so. And this is not all the workplace that will allow you to do that. So, uh, yeah. it, it also sounds, if I may, it also sounds like you you were like you were able and willing to like see the opportunities for being creative with this situation. Yeah. Like for example, with the with the PhD student yeah. and like reading the thesis. Well, so like like finding basically ways around rather than you know just being like oh no this doesn't work right. It you know like why? Because there's a very important saying in science of stress that I always apply. And it's true. In every adversity, there's always an opportunity. Always. Stress ensures survival of the species because it pushes humans to adapt, right? Now, in order to adapt, you need to accept something. You need to accept to adapt to the stress or you need to accept to make mistakes. You need to do trial and error. So you try something, it doesn't work. Don't sit on the floor crying your life. Just try something else. Look at this, stress ensures survival of the species because it pushes humans to adapt. Now, in order to adapt, humans will do trial and error, right? This is why with centuries, they will become more and more intelligent, and this is why we have Google today instead of being behind a mammoth with a spear. This is how it works. So in every adversity, there's always an opportunity. But what I see a lot is people facing an adversity, taking a fetal position on the floor saying it's the end. It's a mindset. Most of the time, life can be tough. It's a mindset. Second thing that I've put together in science when time was rough, you need a community. The young generation, you have more of a sense of community than we had in my time. And God, this is great. Never let this go. So you need to have a sense of community. Scientists, I'm really looking forward. The thing that I miss the most during the pandemic are the scientific meetings. They're not there for nothing. I realize that. My thinking is getting down. I need to be surrounded by scientists. And this is how it gets, you know. So we need this sense of community. So uh, never, never let go of scientific meetings. Go with the kids if you want. Uh, Isabel Perez told me something important, and I always did it. She had two children. She would bring one at the time. This is very nice time with the child, and then she would bring another one, and it's true, it's, a, it's easier as well as scientists. But uh, don't let go of the scientific meeting and of this community. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, like I also hope that these meetings can help to establish uh, some community exactly. of this sort, and I think your speaking here is contributing to that very thing too. Um, more questions, yes. Yeah, I have a question. I feel like um, you need to know and understand the like marketing side of science. Because as you said, um, stress studies is sexy, etc. But for example, enzyme studies are so really important, but no, not so appealing. So how can you like join the appealing side of the study also with the um, um, I don't know how to say it, but... Oui, mais, en français, vous avez dit en français que j'en ai manqué des bouts parce que mon, mon oreille n'est pas très bonne. J'ai l'impression qu'on a vraiment besoin de comprendre euh, la partie marketing de la science parce qu'il faut pouvoir intéresser les gens et aussi elle pour avoir les, les fonds. Il faut trouver des sujets qui sont intéressants, mais il y a aussi des sujets qui sont intéressants pour la science plus que pour le côté marketing de la chose. 
Oui. It's a very good question for those uh, who didn't get the question. So there's a marketing side to science, you know, when you do knowledge transfer, etc. And even now in the grant application, they ask you, you know, will you do knowledge transfer? And knowledge transfer, it's not just giving a conference and a scientific meeting. So, so I have a sexy thing, topic for that. But again, if you're working on enzyme P450, etc., it may not be something. Or and, another enzyme. Or another enzyme. No. We absolutely, totally need fundamental research. And I think that once, and I said that to CIHR at a different meeting, when CIHR turned around and said, no, let's transfer, okay, 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 but it's not all fields, and they kind of forgot fundamental research, and they suffered from that. They quite suffered from that, and now it's coming back, and it's always like a pendulum, okay? So it's not every field of research, but at the same time, I was on a lot of grant applications, and I read I read grants on stuff, you know, complicated stuff, the little stuff, you know, the dish. But the person was able to. You have to zoom out. You have to zoom out in time, and and say, okay, in a hundred years, what I do here, what could it bring? That's the only thing that people need to understand, and that's enough to interest about anyone. And even opportunistic like I am, let's say I'm working on enzyme P450. Stop with it. Now. I could tell you that because it transforms cholesterol and pregnenolone, in the long term it could have an impact on stress hormones and I could develop a pill to decrease your stress. <laughs> and then what I would do with this, I would create a website where I could give all the information I know. I would go into school in biochemistry trying to interest students in that, etc. Why do I create the website? Websites are very important because this is where people go to. And uh, it becomes very, very popular. It's a go-to place. I will come back to this. We do recruitment for our participants in there. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of things. And you can do a website for almost anything. It's very good to recruit students as well because they want to know. They see that they're... You know, they see that there's a life there, they see my students, they see the parties that we're doing, they see all the stuff, so they get interested. Because when you become a scientist, it's not that easy to find students. I mean, there's a lot of scientists, there's a lot of topics, I mean, you have to find students. So there's always a way to do it, but at the same time, you don't want to overdo it. Because if you overdo it, you will be accused of pseudoscience. There's a thin line, that I teach the difference between science and pseudoscience in this class, there's a thin line between scientific stuff and pseudoscience, and knowledge transfer is the line sometimes. So it's a tough job to do. There's a lot of good classes here in psychology. I think gives a very good class on the knowledge transfer, but you're absolutely, totally right that it, it, it's not easy for the same field of research. but you can find a sexy spin. You can find a sexy spin on almost everything. When I was a director of the research center, that's the thing I loved the most. I was like, talk to me about what you're doing. I'm gonna find a spin on this. And we would eventually find a spin for the damn functional significance paragraph that people have to do. Just one thing you made me think of. Crazy as I am, I wrote, I wrote en français, on dit des livres de vulgarisation scientifique. So, Books for the public on the science of stress, right? The books for the public that I write on the science of stress have 400 references in it because it's based on science. And I was very upset to see my books when I go to the library, for example, in the same section as uh, Croissance Personnelle, comment on dit ça en anglais? Yeah, personal growth. Personal growth and, uh, you know, like the secret or something like that. There's a major difference between a scientific book for the public and personal growth. And I have, it's not an elitist point of view that I'm taking. I read personal growth books, but it has nothing to do. And if scientists don't write books for the public, it's one of the reasons. They don't want to end up near the secret. Look, it has nothing to do. Why would they do this when they could write grant applications and get money, right? But the public needs these things. So I was so upset of seeing my books in the personal growth thing and that I, the, the other thing that was upsetting me was that si the public doesn't know, doesn't know how to make the difference most of the time between personal growth and scientific book for the public. So I created, I founded the publishing company, what else, hmm, 
where it's specializing in scientific books for the public. Because I said I know almost every scientist in Quebec <laughs> working on the brain. So I'm going to try to convince them to write books for the public. And we're going to do what we do in science. We will have a committee revising the book to make sure that it is written for the public, but not doing pseudoscience, the thin line. And there's another committee of what I call designated writers. This is your mother and your grandmother who will read the book and now say, I don't understand this. And when this happens, I go back to the scientist says, epigenetic, you need to go simpler than that. It doesn't work. And what I want to do with this is offer a safe place for the public to say, okay, when I go there, I know that these are books written for the, by scientists for the public. I'm going to understand because the grandmother read it and she understood it. And I don't know, and the, my next step one day, if I retire, which I'm not sure I will, uh, they do this in Australia. In Australia, a bunch of scientists, tired of this as well, decided to team up community and write the list of scientific books for the public and give them to librarians saying, you need to create a specific section. These are the books. Because we're the one who know that the librarian cannot know the difference between a book by Floris and a book by I don't know who. And then eventually we will be able to offer the public, uh, you know, they can make a they can make a choice. They can make an informed choice. So uh, long answer, but saying that you can do a lot of things. Everything is possible. I, I want to jump in there also and just like highlight what what I, I think I'm getting about like how you're you're functioning. It's like you're you're also like going to into all sorts of initiatives right away like when you see there's a need like for example in this case of, of the of the like you know they're the, like your books ending up in the wrong section mm -hmm. essentially is like finding a way to do something about that yeah um so i'm a problem solver yeah i'm a yeah. problem solver this is when i have the most fun actually when when i start something when when science for me starts to be parametric Okay, I had two stressors, I had a good stress response. I'm gonna add three or four, I'm bored, <laughs> I'm bored. Right. Some of my colleagues can do it, but this is not my mind works. And I'm very happy now, I was able to uh, uh, convince Tania Lecomte to write a small book for the public, how to take care of someone who has a mental health disorders, because after the pandemic, uh, we had you know, some, a lot of people, so I'm starting to uh, bring many people for lunch, Loris, yeah. to have them uh, write books and uh, like that. So uh, perhaps it's going to work. And you know what? If it doesn't work, what do I have to lose besides time and energy? And we tried. And, like, everything is. You can, we can do almost everything. But at the same time, I'm not writing as many grants as I was. And I'm not writing as many papers. And I'm perfectly fine with this. Great. I'd love to see if there's questions on Zoom by any chance. There is one. I think you maybe have already started to answer it, but I'll say it again. What advice do you give to students who aren't sure what their career will be after graduation? How do you suggest people find their own science-related career path? I will answer the same thing as with stress. Follow your intuition. And I will tell you, what I said to my children, in order to be, I think, happy in your... But first, start stress. Stop stressing with the career. It's not, again, because you don't have an academic career that your life is over and you, you did your PhD for nothing or even... As I always say with a PhD, there's a low probability you will end up uh, working, I don't know, uh, in the small office store. And even if it's that and you're happy, life is good. Okay, so that's perfectly fine. But what I've asked, I would say... First, you can create your own career. I had two students from my, uh, who did the PhD with me and postdoc decided that nah, academic career didn't like, and they started something very interesting. It, uh, they, they, they created a, a new company that is called uh, Imer Science, and these are kind of scientific consultant to do knowledge transfer. They know how to do a PubMed search. They know how to do a research literature, etc. So there is a very popular uh, show in Quebec that is called a pharmacien, for example. This is a pharmacist doing uh, shows that do, they do all the research for him. And they have a lot of money coming from this, and they do a lot of stuff, a lot of shows. They do uh, blogs, and they do a podcast for people, and they do all the scientific. So these two girls had a lot of imagination and said, Let's try this and let's see if it works. So you will find your pathway, but let me give you the two advice I gave to my children. 
I think that's, that's important to find your own pathway. You have to combine two things, as I always say. And I think that's what I've done, actually. Passion and ta talent. First, talent. We all know the talents we have, right? Our mothers already told us. So, me, I have a talent for communicating. I have a big mouth, blah, blah, blah. I'm not shy. This is a talent. I'm going to use it. And I have more than one. You always have more than one. So, you just list your talent and that you know it's easy. The second one is the tough one. You have to find your passion. And that's the tough one because it's not sitting on a chair in your apartment that you will find your passion. In order to find your passion, you have to try a lot of things. This is why I said to my children, do a lot of volunteer work on anything. Go work with the animals and go work with the elderly and go. And at some point, a bit like what happened with Sperry and Gazaniga, it was not, you're going you're gonna to end up doing something and you're going to say, wow, that's it. You're going to know because it's going to be obvious. And then combining this with your talent is going to be the best way for you not to end up in my lab and have a very interesting job. For example, my friend who became a scientific journalist, he was doing a PhD in biochemistry on cellule souche or whatever, bored, bored to death, even thinking that he would be teaching was a bien. And then uh, there was a, a, a specific... Uh, thing that you could apply to, you know, just to write a scientific uh, newspaper article, a concours, and you just won it, and you work, uh, he, he, he won with this, uh, he had six months working at Radio Canada, and then bam, he was gone. But you have to try something. So the problem I see with my own students, they want to succeed, they want to succeed, they want to succeed, they just study, they just study, and I said, you're going to hit a wall. Because if you just do this, you don't expand what could can be anything. It can be what these two girls did. It can be scientific journalism. It can be whatever. And then you will apply it. So I think it's a, you need imagination. And a lot of trying also, it sounds like. And a, a lot, lot of, of trying and not be afraid of, uh, come on, so not losing the, the l'échec. Yeah, like the, failing. the, the failing. failing. Failing is absolutely necessary to grow. I know I sound like Oprah when I say this, but damn, it's true. <laughs> failing is okay. It's, there's nothing wrong with failing. Science, we, not, we don't train our students like that. And failing, we have to succeed. We have to succeed. It's impossible. I mean, there's too much pressure on these kids. I mean, it's impossible. And uh, if you have your paper rejected, it's a good thing. We write the paper, and that's it. Then. And I love that. I, I think that's like there could be a whole session about that. I think yeah. it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually a lot of things that you said today also are like are highlighting the importance of like working with these failures, like the failure of like your 12 week intervention in, uh, in the schools, <laughs> which like really was yeah. became the impetus for for something like incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Do we have more questions online? Uh, just the or name of the company. Immer Science. Immer Science, which is I M M E R Science. Immer Science. And there's a couple of other stuff I saw. A couple of uh, previous students who started some podcast on science. I oh, I have a couple, another student of mine. She had a grand uh, dialogue, which is very good. Uh, FRSQ dialogue to work with the public. They give you about twenty thousand dollars to develop something that can get bigger and bigger, go, go, go there, it's so much fun, and I will review you anyway. Uh, and uh, Catherine Raymond, a former student of PhD, she started to do a podcast with her boyfriend, which is well known, he's a humorist or something, and she has the science, he has the, 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 the funny side, so uh, they do uh, this podcast where they have someone very well known coming in and talking about, I don't know, spontaneous anger, whatever, and, and then she explains the science. God, are they popular with the young people. I mean, it's amazing what they have done. So it's your imagination. You know better than we do at this age of everything. And the public is very, very interested in science. Science said for the public. And I think if I have only one advice to tell you, never talk so that they feel less intelligent. Don't do that. Intellectual masturbation doesn't work, but this is how we call it. It doesn't work. You can explain science in a way that they will understand. I know you can talk science the way they will understand. And if you don't do this, they will turn around and leave. Yeah. Do we have more questions? 
this is your chance to ask Sonia. Uh, uh, at some point, you um, talked about the effect of making negative predictions on, I guess, stress and performance. If you're able to reframe it into a positive prediction, is that going to increase your resistance to stress? Oh, yes. Such interesting studies. I'm going to take five minutes to answer your... Can, do I have five minutes? We have time. You're going to learn so much. It's so interesting. What you are referring to is called preconception, stress, stress mindset, actually, in English. And a mindset is not necessarily negative. A mindset is just the way you think. For example, if I ask you for the next Olympics, who do you think is going to win uh, running uh, between the guy from Africa and the guy from Kazakhstan? You're going to say, by the guy from Africa, and I'm going to say, why? Because we know that Africans run fast. This is a mindset. And scientists are starting to be very interested in stress mindset because they found that most people have negative stress mindset. Okay, and negative stress mindset is that you think that stress is negative and it will, it's toxic and it's going to kill you. There's a few people who have positive stress mindset. Most of them are either athletes or comedians. Athletes, why? Because they know that a stress response increases your strength by five to seven times. So if you have a competition of judo tomorrow, you want to be stressed, you're going to be very strong, you're going to get it. Comedian, I will always remember this woman. She was a comedian. She told me, Sonia, the only time in my life where I didn't have the track, I was very bad. You know? So they know. But most people have negative stress mindset. Why? Because of scientists and the media. Scientists, because scientists, we always study the negative. You don't get a grant if you study positive stuff in science. You know, we have to solve a problem. So we basically just measure the negative effects of stress, reported this, the media picked it up, and this is all you see in the show. The thing is, in 1997, I found for the first time when I was in New York an inverted U-shaped function between stress and well-being slash performance. So a little bit of stress is very good. You want it. And at a certain resistance, which is different for everyone, you are on the bad side. Now, scientists took people who had negative stress mindset, brought them to the lab, measured their stress hormones, and took people who had positive stress mindset, brought them to the lab, measured stress hormones, and they found that those who have negative stress mindsets produce significantly more stress hormones than those who have positive stress mindset. I want you to pick this up. So, the way you see stress will determine if you're stressed or not. That's big. Now, what they did after that, they took people who had negative stress mindset, and for a week, they showed them videos summarizing the positive effects of stress. And in contrast, they took people who had positive mindset and showed them the toxic effects of stress. And they were able to decrease the stress hormones in those in whom they showed positive effects of stress and increase it. So what we see on media, all this has a significant impact. And that there's a lot of school coming to me and saying, my God, there's an epidemic of anxiety in schools, etc." And I said, I'm not surprised. Why? Because these kids have negative stress mindset. And what they have is called um, anxiety sensitivity, which is the fear of being stressed. So for many, many of these kids, when they feel a stress response, they freak out. They're sure they're going to die because they have negative stress mindset. This is when I say to teachers, for example, take a 14-year-old child. Since this child was born, all the social media he's reading tells him that stress is negative, it's toxic, and it's going to kill him. And then we are surprised when this child has a normal stress response before an exam that he freezes and he's sure he's going to die. This is what we told him. So this is what, now in the De-Stress for Success project, I said we have to enter positive stress mindset. So now I don't talk to any journalist if they don't allow me to summarize the positive effects of stress, and some of them refuse. Okay. Mm -hmm. One last study I want to talk to you about so that I convince you when you have children, because what you say to people around you will have an impact. My good colleague, Jeremy Jamison in the US, did a study. I said, this is a sexy study. So he took a group of 10 years old, and he stressed them, and then he measured their memory performance, inverted U-shape function, right? Split the group in two. To the first kids, the, to the first group, he said, I'm going to stress you. And in order for you to recognize the stress response, well, the stress response is, you know the big nod you have in your stomach before? This is stress. And then he measured the performance. Stress them in the measure. To the other group of child, he said, okay, I'm going to stress you. And in order for you to recognize the stress response, well, the stress response is, you know the little butterflies you have in your stomach. <laughs> and the results, you know the results by now. 
When he says to children that it's a big nod, they are on the right hand side. They produce a lot of stress hormones, decrease memory performance. And when he tells them it's butterflies, they produce enough to increase performance. So what we say to our children, to our employees, to our students, this is you see what I was saying, shut up if you are going to say bad stuff. Because the brain is computing this and it has a significant effect on so these and sometimes you have your own negative stress mindset. So I know it sounds like very esoteric, but God, these are biological stress hormones. I mean, what can we say more than that besides the fact that what you interpret has a significant impact? So I started teaching teachers about that, and some of them called me back and they said, Sonia, for some children, they don't care, but for some others, first, they don't believe us when we say it can be positive. They just don't believe us, and it's a game changer for some of them. They totally start freaking up, and for those listening to me and I have children, some of my students who do a lot of knowledge transfer decided to do during the pandemic some uh, short videos to help children understand these stress mindsets, so they stop freaking out with stress. And it's, uh, it's called stress and go in English. And in French, I think it's surf ton stress. So they did this uh, all free uh, at night, a couple of, uh, of my students, to teach children before their exams so that when you stop being fearful of stress, you can increase your performance. So uh, yeah, exactly. Amazing. On that on that note, uh, I'm just like looking at the time, and uh, like I feel Sonia, I, I can listen to you for hours. And I could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad that it's true. Um, so uh, I would like to just um, wrap up the official part of this, which means you know you can like still linger on. Maybe we can like keep Sonia here for like a little moment to like benefit from her wisdom. I just want to say, uh, so this was growing up in science. Uh, we are on uh, Facebook. So like you said, website sites are important, so we have a website, it's uh, with the CRBLM, and I think we're on Facebook and lots of other things as well. I just want to acknowledge uh, briefly the support from CRBLM uh, in making this happen, um, the sort of web space and organizational support, uh, Université de Montréal for this wonderful space and all the, the tech goodies, uh, and talking about tech, we have like uh, Kevin with us, and I just Thanks, want to say... particular big thank you for Kevin today because uh, I think he showed remarkable stress resistance, resistance. I think we could say, right? <laughs> uh, because this this, uh, this place opened only five minutes ahead of time, whereas like I had promised him he was going to have like at least an hour to set up. So um, I think it, it's amazing how he put this all together. So thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and so our, glo our um, uh, Growing Up in Science team is Heather from the CRBLM, Claire, Anka, Alexandra, Jasmine, Semane. Uh, Samane, sorry, uh, Ming and Shuyi. So thank you all for contributing to that. Uh, Growing Up in Science is an, um, uh, like a chapter from a global worldwide network. You can look up talks from all over the world. This was spearheaded by Weiji Ma at NYU, and you can look up uh, growingupinscience.com. And thank you everyone for joining with your questions and your attention. And of course, most of all, Sonia, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your, your fun and your passion and your lessons. And um, I'm looking forward to interacting more with you because like, she's a colleague of ours. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great thank day. Thank you, everyone.